we are talking about HDFS as the storage. So HDFS is good in lot of places and it gives uh, a very good performance uh, for the big data workload. And with uh, a centralized master node uh, having everything in memory, we have we are providing good performance uh, with HDFS. So things were going good for a while uh, with HDFS. We did not run into major issues or uh, blockers with HDFS and we, we had good the HDFS community. But as data started growing, HDFS uh, uh, was not able to... Uh, One sec, can, can you start the recording? This will be very valuable to review later also. It is being recorded, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So H HDFS has a lot of good qualities, like strong consistency, uh, if you write the file, uh, there are a lot of storage uh, object stores or files where you will get eventually it will be an eventually consistent system. But in HDFS, we, we have strong consistency, reliability, uh, high availability, and we have very strong security. And we uh, HDFS also introduced this uh, uh, layer or uh, Hadoop common layer where they have defined the Hadoop compatible file system API. So in the Hadoop uh, ecosystem, if uh, you want to plug in a different storage or use different storage like Amazon S3 or uh, Microsoft Azure uh, or even HDFS, you don't have to rewrite your application or uh, rewrite your client code multiple times. Since we, we have this Hadoop compatible file system API, if a storage provider like Amazon, uh, they want to save Hadoop applications, they can just provide a connector. So this is three connector and a bus connector. They translate the Hadoop uh, compatible file system called Amazon S3 call or Microsoft Azure call. So all the uh, it, uh, products in the Hadoop ecosystem, they just use Hadoop compatible file system. They are not tightly coupled with HDFS as a storage. So these are all a lot of good things that we had in HDFS. But th there were limitations once the sta uh, data started exploding in big data world. The main uh, good thing about HDFS was its performance. From that performance was because of having all the metadata in memory. So name node has everything in memory. The FS image or all the namespace uh, content is in memory. That is why HDFS is able to provide such good throughput or performance. But the downside of uh, that is that uh, you cannot keep scaling HDFS uh, linear. So we, we have a limitation on HDFS uh, because of the reason uh, we have everything in memory to get the performance. We are compromising on scalability over there. So HDFS has a limitation of around 350 million objects or files. Once you cross that limit, you will start running into scalability issues or uh, other issues with HDFS. Like if you restart the cluster, the name node will take six, seven hours to come up because it has to load all the information into memory. And there will be a lot of uh, GC issues and uh, your throughput will also be done. Is, is there any question on the I guess I request all to actually go on mute. Please. Okay. So, okay. HDFS. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, you're there. Yeah. So, so with HDFS, we have this famous problem of uh, small files. So we always recommend when HDF, people use HDFS, we always say that you cannot use uh, HDFS for storing small files because small files is going to take a lot of metadata space. And uh, there will be a lot of block reports sent from data node to name node and name node has to cause all the block reports, which will also cause performance issue with HDFS. So there were a lot of solutions proposed to address these problems in HDFS. So they, then the 
garbage collection uh, zgc uh, claims that he can support up to 16 terabyte of heap but even then we cannot scale hdfs uh, 10x or 100x scale. we can just go with current 350 we can scale it to 2x maybe 700 million objects but we cannot go beyond that even if we keep increasing the heap and even if we keep increasing the heap the startup time of main node will still be an issue and there were other proposals like having uh, just working uh, data set in memory or partial name space in memory for name node and also uh, the problem with that approach was that people started working on it but later they realized that name node or in hdfs world the block management and the name space management are very tightly coupled so we have to separate them first in order to have a partial name space in memory so then it became difficult for us to do the separation and also do an block space scalability so these uh, were the jira sin apache community where people uh, started working on addressing the scalability uh, limits of hdfs but uh, all these jira has still open because uh, we don't have an easy solution to uh, go and fix this problem in hdfs so uh, in H hdfs itself uh, we started uh, thinking why can't we uh, rewrite the whole storage layer and come up with a new, new or next generation storage which is scalable and also provides same performance and feature set as hdfs for for that we uh, first have to understand the problems that we ran into with hdfs and also we should know the good things that we have in hdfs and carry them forward to ozone so we borrowed a lot of things from hdfs that were good at the same time we started trying to address the problem of uh, the scalability so what we learned from hdfs is that uh, hdfs provides uh, the client scalability or io scalability and also uh, the fault tolerance those things were carried forwarded and uh, we understood the problem with hdfs uh, scalability issue is that the name space and the block space layer are tightly coupled so in the new uh, project we first the main idea is to have a clear separation of block space and the name space layer and uh, once we separate or split the problem into two we have smaller piece of problems that we can address now we have a separate name space layer which we have to uh, see how we can address the scalability issue of name space layer and we have a separate block space layer where we can go and identify a way to address the scalability issue of block space layer so the primary goals that we had uh, been start uh, when we started ozone is that uh, we should support all the existing use cases that uh, are run on hdfs so it should be a uh, transparent to the user or users should not have to modify their application code to make the switch from hdfs to ozone so the application should be portable enough uh, we talked about the hadoop compatible file system api right so in ozone we have decided that we will adhere to that file system api so that no application uh, has to change their code or um, make changes to work make it work on top of ozone and uh, uh, in hdfs we had this uh, data node sending a uh, block reports uh, to name node so uh, the number of blocks that are sent in the report that also has impact on performance because of which we cannot go with a dense data node in hdfs we also wanted to address that problem so that we can really have a very dense data node in ozone let's say in hdfs you have 100 node cluster uh, if you want to uh, store the same amount of data in those you don't have to have uh, those many number of data nodes you can just go with uh, 100 data and 50 to 100 data nodes which will have this which will hold the same amount of data since we have dense data node support here and since we are developing it from scratch we also had this idea like uh, 
apart from supporting big data workload, we also wanted to support uh, APIs or clients like S3 and also uh, have uh, this POS6 compliant or raw block storage. They are still uh, in the roadmap. We haven't implemented those things yet, but the plan is to implement them in future. So out of all these uh, discussions and brainstorming, then came uh, the scalable, redundant, distributed object store. So the reason for going with object store rather than sticking with the hierarchical file system, which HDFS is that if we want to, uh, if you uh, recall, we had the scalability issue, right? We have split the problem into two now. We have namespace. Uh, layer separated and the block space layer separated, but still we haven't addressed the scalability issue. Now we have to address the scalability issue. To address the scalability issue of namespace layer, we we are we are going with the approach where we want to have partial metadata in memory. That means that uh, half or uh, we will not load everything uh, into memory uh, in the namespace layer. For that, it it is easy for us to do that with an object store. It is hard for us to do the same with an file store because it has a relationship uh, between uh, directories and uh, files. So the uh, decision was made to go with an object store for Ozone. And then we had different approaches or different ways to solve the scalability issues of blocks storage. So these are all the points that we had in mind when we started working on Ozone. It has to be strongly consistent and the architecture of Ozone should be very simple to understand. Even if someone new comes in, you should be able to easily uh, explain how Ozone works or how the architecture of Ozone looks. And we should have the same uh, APIs uh, that people are familiar with uh, so that uh, people who worked on HDFS already should not see uh, very new to Ozone. They should be very comfortable uh, with Ozone since the APIs will be seen the way that you use the storage system will not change much. And since we are uh, developing from scratch, we uh, made a decision that uh, it, it should be modular, like uh, splitting the block space and having a clear separation on the responsible piece. So we had uh, Clear building blocks uh, using which we can uh, we wanted to construct ozone, which can work independently. And ozone was uh, ozone uh, even uh, still now it is completely open source. So all the development that happens in ozone it happens in Apache. So th there is no other change inside ozone which is not there in Apache. So we will cover a little bit about the Ozone community that we have. So uh, we, we have a lot of open source community partners. So we have Target, uh, Cisco, Tencent, G Research, Bloomberg, HP, or they are uh, we are partners in open source community where they work on Ozone features uh, with us and we interact with them on a regular basis to uh, define the roadmap of Ozone. So uh, this is a snapshot of 2022. Uh, now we have more committers and more PMCs. Uh, in a uh, snapshot of 2022, we had around 28 PMC members and around 61 committers across the world. Uh, people uh, are from US, Hungary, India, China, Germany, and from different uh, companies as well. As I mentioned uh, before, um, multiple companies are involved uh, in the open source development of Ozone. And we, we have around more than 5,000 commits made into uh, Ozone main branch itself. So we released uh, Ozone uh, 1.0, uh, which is beta in September 2020, and the latest version, uh, which is uh, out in open source community is uh, 1.3. It has features like uh, erasure coding, uh, container balancer, S3, S3 support and also we also introduced the file system layer uh, in Ozone. So you have both object store uh, APIs and also file system APIs to interact with the same storage system. 
and we we have a very active community and uh, uh, if you want to get help or get involved in the development of ozone you can just uh, send a mail to the ozone mailing list or we have apache uh, slack channel and we also conduct uh, community sync meeting every week and there is uh, one sync which happens with uh, in us or europe friendly time zone and there is one sync uh, which happens in asia friendly time zone you can find all these uh, details on the ozone uh, wiki page um, can we take a short break before getting into that text or can no, it no, we can ask them yeah do you guys feel we need a short break or we can continue with the architecture part you go it wasn't but yeah Okay, you have already ordered once again. Go ahead. Yeah, they didn't know any questions on uh, the requirements or why we started Ozone or any questions on he even HDFS. Yeah, go. Yes, um, like when we talk about the HDFS uh, versus the Ozone and uh, and there is always this concept of the small file thing that you have uh, explained brilliantly that you know the kind of metadata it creates is a problem for the small file so mm -hmm. that thing is it sorted by ozone can we uh, claim this or uh, that is not the situation we we have uh, solved that though uh, we will see how it is solved uh, while we cover the ozone architecture so to solve that problem we have First, split the problem into two, uh, like namespace and uh, block space. Now we want to uh, scale the namespace layer. Since a uh, small file problem is uh, affecting the metadata that is stored in the name node in HDFS world, it explodes the amount of data that name node handles. So we, we have a clear separation of namespace now, and uh, we have made a decision to go with an object store. So we are keeping a uh, partial metadata in memory so we don't load or have all the metadata information in memory we uh, use internally use rocksdb to store all the information and as and when user queries or write it's a new file it is written into rocksdb when user uh, tries to read the file we read the metadata from rocksdb so there is no memory pressure on the master mode in ozone for uh, even if you store more or small files everything mm -hmm. is written to this the only cache here is that you have to use SSD disks for master nodes. Since we are uh, doing a disk I/O for uh, file read and write, we need a faster disk. We do caching uh, in places where the files are read frequently, but there is a chance that you will be uh, doing a uh, disk I/O for a uh, file write or file read. Okay, all right, great. Uh, so we can always claim this that we are uh, solving the uh, small file problem through ozone that's what yeah. they can make in the field with the customers yeah yeah definitely and is there any kind of uh, uh, comment on the block size also the kind of block size is taken by hdfs versus the uh, ozone is there any so kind the of block size is same uh, to address the um, block uh, management layer or to scale the block management layer we have introduced something called containers we, we will see what container is or how we are addressing the block space layer scalability issue till now we have just talked about uh, the scalability issues of uh, namespace layer and uh, we just uh, touched on uh, how we are trying to solve the scalability issue in the namespace layer what we are coming uh, now to is that the other uh, problem that we have where we want to address the scalability issue of uh, blocks. The block size is same in Ozone, but we have a different approach to address the scalability problem. Okay. Thank you. So before getting into the internals or how uh, things work inside Ozone, uh, we have to see uh, how uh, the data is arranged in Ozone or how user sees the data. 
so we uh, said that ozone is an object store so in object store uh, there is no uh, relationship between our uh, two keys or you don't have an uh, directory of file relationship parent child relationship so the key uh, entities in uh, ozone object store are volume buckets and keys volumes if you are familiar with the uh, s3 world volumes are similar to the user accounts that are there in s3 inside which you can create lots of buckets and write keys so the buckets in ozone are similar to s3 buckets and we we can just uh, start writing our uh, data into the buckets which are keys you can give the path the full path like a volume slash bucket slash any key name that you want and you, you can start writing data so uh, volumes are uh, created it is similar to the user account in uh, s3 world so volumes are created only by the administrators buckets user can create buckets in volume and they can start writing the data and we said we also support uh, the hadoop compatible file system api so that api uh, is to access a storage as an hierarchical file store so what we have done is that we have built an hierarchical file system on top of this flat key value store so now you have an api file system api to access the same uh, internally it is an object store but you have an file system api you can consider or assume this is a, as an file system and access the storage you can even have an uh, object store api to access it recently we have introduced uh, bucket types where you can see okay i am creating this bucket and i want to use this bucket as an file system so ozone will optimize that bucket for file system access and by creating bucket if you say i want to use this bucket as an object store ozone will optimize the bucket for uh, object store access we haven't uh, uh, covered that bucket type and other things in detail in the slide because it would take uh, much more time to cover all the features or everything that is there in ozone we have just covered the high level architecture but uh, if you guys uh, uh, have questions or doubts or uh, need more info on any uh, feature or anything that you are not familiar with just uh, unmute yourself and ask the question we can talk about that or discuss or can type it on slack yeah yeah you you can just ping it on slack chat 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 so you zoom chat no chat right so any questions still now on the volumes buckets and uh, the keys that we have so uh, i'll add to that number like uh, so as nanda mentioned that uh, ozone merits the goodness of stfs so so uh, bucket is the place where we set the, the storage policies as well like encryption integer coding those kind of storage are also like set at the bucket level Yeah, that, that thanks for that, Nilo. Good questions, anyone? You can just ping it on Zoom chat, or or else we can continue. Yeah, let me continue. So we have actually pretty much covered this one. Why we chose object store like API? Um, this is mainly because we want to scale the namespace layer. It is easier to scale uh, the object store uh, metadata rather than uh, trying to scale an hierarchical namespace. But we have also built a file system uh, like uh, operations on top of this object store layer. And this, uh, since we are providing this uh, file system like uh, AP or Hadoop compatible APs, uh, all the existing big data applications, they doesn't have to uh, do any changes to uh, accommodate ozone. Okay, we talked about splitting uh, the namespace layer and the block space layer, but uh, we haven't touched on how we are doing it or wh what are all the things that we are using it internally to uh, build uh, ozone. 
so for any distributed systems uh, we need uh, some kind of uh, consensus protocol or some kind of uh, implementation of uh, consensus protocol so we uh, in ozone we didn't uh, build or we didn't have uh, in we didn't want to build our own consensus uh, protocol so we have used this uh, raft apache uh, that is which is a raft implementation which is in separate apache project so that provides us uh, and consensus protocol so so raft is used internally uh, to make sure that uh, we have hiche on the master nodes or the data that you write on the data nodes are properly replicated to the other data nodes all these things are achieved using apache uh, ratis and, and let me explain storage container and the other things okay so we have this separation of namespace and block space which is not there in hdfs so we have split the metadata part into two so instead of having one master service now in ozone we have two master services one is ozone manager and the other one is uh, storage container manager so the role of ozone manager is just to manage the namespace so you have the file name or key name to the block id mapping it will not uh, know where the block is or it will not track any blocks at all it will just have a mapping of file to list of blocks so it is the role of this hdds layer hadoop distributed data store layer to provide block storage to ozone manager so the storage container manager it uh, has to handle uh, all the data nodes how the block is being stored how it is being accessed so to solve the scale, uh, scalability issue we have uh, gone with the partial namespace in memory for ozone manager for uh, for addressing the scalability issue of block layer or block space what we have done is that uh, yeah we have introduced something called uh, storage containers uh, don't get confused with uh, the container uh, kubernetes containers or docker containers they they are completely different so what we do to address the block scalability issue is that instead of tracking each and every block we group blocks from a unique called container we just track those containers so what the master service the scm will do is that it will track the containers that are present in the cluster it will not track the blocks individually so the metadata that we have to maintain of uh, for the data that is there in the cluster will be reduced so where does this block information go then so this block information are stored or distributed across data nodes inside the container itself so each container will have information about the list of blocks that are there inside this container and if you want to uh, read a, a blog you will just go to a scm and get the container in which that block is present and then go to that data node and ask for the block so the data node has the container which has the list of blocks that is there inside the container this is how we distribute the metadata across the day block metadata across the data node to solve the block scalability issue so this covers mostly the same thing that we uh, were talking till now so the namespace is managed by this master service called ozone manager which will have partial metadata in memory or just the working set in memory the block space is managed by scm and uh, instead of tracking blocks scm just tracks container and the default container size is 5 gb which is configurable so once a container uh, reaches a file db they are closed and no more writes are allowed on that container by scaling the namespace and block uh, space independently we can uh, we are addressing the scalability issue that we had uh, in hdfs world yeah so i'll i'll add to that again uh, so yeah. in ozone 
we are sending container reports instead of block reports. So the container reports are quite lightweight than block reports and it puts much less pressure on the master node. So yep, I think there was way there was one query asked previously, right? So how are we solving the scalability issues? I think uh, regarding blocks, right? So I think the block reports we are not sending anymore in Ozone. So we are sending container reports instead of that. Yeah, thanks for this. So in HDFS, we had the problem of uh, report processing as well. When the cluster uh, reaches around 50 million, the block reports that are sent by data nodes, uh, which gets accumulated or has to be processed by the node, that affects the new node's performance. Here, since as Nilotpal mentioned, uh, uh, we are just sending the container. Since ACM is not tracking blocks, it is just tracking containers. It will receive only container reports rather than block reports and uh, the container reports will be lightweight because container size is 5 GB as compared to the block size which will be 256 MB. That's the question. Yeah. yeah. When the container goes down, how Ozone ensures the replication? Yeah, uh, good question. Uh, so the reason for deciding the container size was that uh, the unit of replication in Ozone is a container, not a block. So even if one of the block goes corrupt or something uh, is wrong with that, even one block, we replicate the whole container. So we follow the same logic that we had in HDFS for replication. We have three replicas for each block that is there in HDFS. Here we have three replicas of a container. So if one of the replica goes down, SCM detects that and it re-replicates that uh, container in a different data mode. So if you increase your container size to 10 GB, you have to make sure that you have good network to accommodate this re-replication. So let's say your uh, one full data node goes down or a complete rack goes down. You have to see how much network you can uh, you have so that uh, or how much time it will take for the whole data to be re-replicated. Since the unit of replication is a container, you have to be uh, careful in adjusting this container size. Is there a single file that is writing to the So we will have uh, multiple. So we have this concept of open and closed containers. When a container reaches 5 GB, we close the containers and we don't allow any more writes to the container. We allow writes only on open containers. So there will be multiple open containers in the system which takes in writes. So you, you can have multiple clients parallelly writing to the cluster, which are writing into different containers. Yeah, thanks, Stringy, for the clarification. A any more questions? Yeah, no, no, no. yeah. So when uh, we are having the uh, container as a unit and uh, has got its block. So does all these blocks uh, relates to the same file? The one file which is being uh, created or it can house m different uh, files also? Like with okay. the uh, different file names which are there and we are adding on to the data in one particular table, for example, the hive table, which is getting added at your uh, file size. So will this container be dependent on that also or not? So, okay, uh, so what happens is that this HDDS layer, it doesn't know about uh, any or it doesn't have any information about namespace layer. So for a HDDS layer, there is no relationship between one block and another block. Uh, and this layer is the one which is assigning the block to the container. The mapping is only maintained in Ozone Manager. So a container can have uh, blocks from different files. There is no relationship inside the container between the blocks. The relationship is only maintained in uh, the namespace layer or the Ozone Manager. Okay. All right. So, so all things are happening at the Ozone Manager while yeah. the uh, 
lock related things uh, the hdds or the storage container manager doesn't know about the logical things on the namespace yeah exactly so the file uh, if a file has 10 blocks those 10 blocks could be on different containers and one container can have blocks of different files okay okay all right thank you uh one more question is it is it possible or is it uh, is it like at at one point of time there can be multiple containers in open state yeah we we will definitely have multiple containers in open state because we want to even scale the io if we have only one container open then that will become a bottleneck for uh, the right so a cluster will have multiple containers in open state so that uh, and uh, the blocks when you write a file yeah, yeah, it will include them yeah when you write a file fine goes to ozone manager and ozone manager gets block from scm and they start writing the file scm will have multiple containers in open state so that it can allocate blocks on different containers so that the writes can go in parallel so we will definitely have multiple containers in open state okay is there any limit like how many number of containers uh, can be in open state at at one point of time okay so i didn't cover this uh, concept called pipeline we have something called pipeline so we uh, replicate the data on three data nodes right we have containers and the container uh, replica should be present on three data nodes which is the replication factor and this container has to uh, have uh, up to date data or they have to meet in consensus for this we internally use ratis to uh, replicate these containers we call this ratis ring as a pipeline okay so we we have a uh, limited number of pipelines present in the cluster because if we create more pipelines the data nodes uh, network traffic will be too much and the resource will also be placed on the data node if we create pipeline so we will have set of pipelines in the cluster and each pipeline will have limited number of open containers so then uh, you can configure these things to increase the number of open containers in the system but uh, it is not unlimited or we don't uh, keep creating open containers they they are limited so we check if it is config driven and the values are set based on our like uh, to, well in the optimal values are set based on our internal testing so we can always change the value required okay okay what okay. thanks 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 yeah so uh we saw that uh, we have we have separate name space and block space layer. Uh, before that, any more questions, or can we continue? Okay, yeah, let's continue. So the responsibility of ozone manager will be uh, just maintaining the metadata, which will be like file name or key name to uh, the block ID mapping, and uh, we we have this uh, metadata of volume buckets as well. and uh, we we have hc implemented for ozone manager with uh, apache ratis so we will be running three ozone managers if you enable hc for ozone manager and uh, internally we uh, use ratis to make sure that the metadata of ozone managers up to date on uh, all the three nodes mm -hmm. the role of uh, scn or the storage container manager is uh, to maintain this container to uh, the data node location where the container is present that mapping as well as the cluster management where it has to identify let's say if a data node is going down or if uh, one of the data node is not reachable those kind of maintenance activity if one of the container goes under replicated all these things are managed by smh same identifies all these things that is happening in the cluster and it takes necessary action based upon the event uh question is if we are using db for storage why ozone uses wrap for ha so this db is an uh 
db which is there on that single node uh, so uh, it is not an external db it is an internal db so rocks db is present only on that node and if that node goes down your rocks db also goes down with that node and uh, you you have lost everything you have single point of failure if you don't have pk so it's it's like a like a default implementation that will use embedded db or it can be used uh like other db like central high availability db similar kind of key value pair db which is centralized okay. uh, we are uh, while developing this we have developed in such a way that uh, we can plug or easily uh, remove uh, this rocks db and plug in different db initially we developed uh, it with uh, level db and later on we had uh, we moved to rocks db but currently it is not configurable by the user <laughs> Yes, yeah, so, uh, good question. So we uh, Zookeeper uh, is an external service that you have to use. Ratis comes uh, with inside Ozone itself. It is a library uh, with uh, Raft implementation. If you want to have Zookeeper, uh, you have to have a separate installation of Zookeeper. Zookeeper is also a consensus protocol implementation, and Ratis also uh, is a consensus protocol implementation. But the difference is that uh, if you want to use Zookeeper, you have to install Zookeeper separately. But if you want to use Rattus, you can just use Rattus as a library. It is same as using RocksDB versus an uh, separate uh, Oracle DB or a separate uh, DB that is running elsewhere. It is, this is embedded one. <laughs> RocksDB, uh, we don't exactly, uh, we, we cannot say we replicate RocksDB, we replicate the complete metadata information that is there in Ozone Manager. So all the three instances of Ozone Manager uh, will have RocksDB and it will have the same information. Basically, we use Rattus to uh, replicate all the operations or events that happens on one Ozone Manager to the other to Ozone Manager and they store this information in RocksDB. So at the end, uh, we make sure that the rocks DBs on all the three nodes are the same, identical. And to make this a high availability also is a similar condition like in the Zookeeper, like you have to maintain three quorum or five quorum for this high yeah. availability. Yeah, so if you uh, have any consensus protocol implementation, uh, you need uh, 2n plus 1 uh, node to tolerate, uh, to tolerate one uh, n node failure. So if you want to tolerate one node failure, you need to have three uh, services running. It is same same as people. Oh, okay. It's not necessary that all will be active. So it can be active passive, but it will participate in that quorum. Yeah, yeah, it will be a leader follower. It will be leader follower. One will be leader and the other two will be followers. Okay. Yeah, there, there will be a leader election uh, with, between them and they will elect the leader. I'm able to understand why grouping of blocks is not possible in ADFS. Actually, it is possible. We have to rewrite the complete uh, data node and uh, name node code. We, we have tight coupling of uh, namespace and block space inside name node. And if you want to have these kind of grouping in um, some kind of uh, super block or container report from data node to uh, name node, you have to rewrite the data node code. Basically, you will be, you will end up rewriting everything that is there in HDFS. So, any, any more questions or? Yeah, so Nanda, like yeah. once we 
are having the these all uh, containers blocks and so how will actually the data uh, once we are getting a request to get some data how will work in entirety to get that particular uh, data back to the client yeah we, we will see the read and write path uh, maybe a couple of slides later okay. we, um, we have that covered okay great yeah this is how uh, the container looks like so we have the blocks which is split into chunks and we have an uh, rocks db inside the container itself which will have all the list of blocks that are there in the container and uh, the block id that is managed or that is present in the namespace layer so we will have files and the list of block ids that correspond to the file right so the uh, structure of block id is such that the first part is container id and second part is a local id so uh, using the first part, we will identify in which container that block is present. And with the local ID, uh, you can actually get the block information. We, we will see how we are writing data and reading data from Ozone in few minutes. So we use, as I mentioned before, we use a wrapped protocol to make sure that the container replication happens properly. And uh, it is similar to what we do in HDFS, just that instead of managing blocks, we are managing containers, which is collection of blocks. <laughs> so this is a high level view of uh, Ozone. Uh, you, you have uh, Ozone Manager and Storage Container Manager Master Service. You have data nodes, and we have a service called Recon, which is a management UI using which you can see uh, how many data nodes are there, how many are healthy, how many containers are there in the cluster, how many pipelines are there, uh, how many volumes you have created, the number of buckets and the total count of keys. All this information you can uh, see it via a recon service. And you have this uh, ozone file system connector which translates or which uh, exposes an file system API, a Hadoop compatible file system API. And you also have an object store API and all which also has an uh, CLI using which you can create containers or write data. It is similar to the commands uh, you have for HDFS. And as I said uh, before, we also wanted to have an S3 uh, interface as well. So we have uh, something called S3 gateways, which will translate your S3 call into Ozone calls. So if you have an application which is written for S3, you can just point it to Ozone S3 gateway and uh, just run your application. You don't have to do any modification to your application. So now you can write application which you can run on uh, public cloud and you can use the same application and uh, without any modification, you can run on your on-prem storage. Coming to uh, the write, how write happens. So when we want to write something into Ozone, the client will just first go to Ozone Manager. It will ask Ozone Manager or it will tell Ozone Manager that I want to write just P. Ozone Manager will uh, make a note of it or will make, uh, record the file name. It will go to SCM. It will ask SCM to allocate a block uh, in which the client can write data. SCM will allocate a block inside the open container and it will return the block ID. This block ID, the first part has the container ID and second part has a local ID. So this block ID is returned to client. And with that block ID, you will have this pipeline information which says that uh, what are all the data nodes uh, which is having this container replica where the client has to connect to and start writing the data. So the client will have the information uh, of the block, which is the block ID, and it will have the information uh, of the pipeline in which it has to write the data. And the block ID has the container ID in which the block has to go in. So the client will go to the set of data nodes uh, where this pipeline is present. 
and there there will be a uh, leader among this data node which will uh, process the client request and it will start writing the data into the corresponding containers so this uh, table that you see this is the rocks db inside that container so it will have the block id and then list of chunks are the location where the actual data is present once the client completes the block write if it has some more data to write it will again go to ozone manager and request for additional block to write and it will follow the same method to write the block to the data node once the write is complete the client will tell ozone manager that uh, i have written this uh, file you can commit this file now and the file will be visible to other clients now so for reading a key a client will first go to ozone manager and it will get the uh, key location info here the key location info uh, is the list of blocks that that has this uh, or that has the data that is corresponding to this key here what ozone manager will do is uh it will actually communicate to uh, scm and cache this uh, container information which, which ozone manager maintains uh, so you you have this list of blocks and the block id has this container id and ozone manager also has this cached information of this container location okay now the client will have uh, the block id and the, the container location as well so the client will go to any one of the data node where this container is present and it will ask the data node to give the block so the block id will have the container id so the a data node will check what is the container id and it will get the local id it will go and query the containers rocks db and get the file location and it will uh, send the data back to the client Gaurav, any questions on how read happens, or do you need more clarification on this part? Yeah. So here, once you know, when we were discussing few slides back, then we were talking of the containers that the container is keeping the blocks information, and yeah. this information is uh, going back to the ozone manager. So ozone manager is not keeping track of the blocks, rather it is keeping track of the file versus right. So yeah. that's why. keeping the lesser information but yeah. on the it seems like everything is being contained by the uh, ozone manager only the no, at the ozone block ozone manager here actually caches the uh, container details there there will be a call that is made to scm if there is uh, the data is not present in cache there will be a call made to scm to get the list of data nodes where this container is present this information the block id to the list of uh, chunks this information is present inside the data node itself okay. yeah so you first is... go to sorry yeah go on sorry yeah so this is on the data node that okay this is the list of chunks and this is the block number and yeah. uh, this the block versus the container information is with the scm yeah container and how many blocks yeah and uh, not how many blocks uh, scm will have information on container and where the container is present the data node ids okay okay container id and the data node id data node id where the container is present okay. not the list of blocks not the list of the blocks so data node so the container id versus the data node id so that particular data node once we reach there then it would search for those particular containers yeah inside that container you will search for the block and then within the container you will search for the block which is happening at the data node itself yeah and once we say that okay one data node is down for say then this exact information is present in some other uh, data node also where this is replicated this container is replicated so yeah. wherever container will be replicated that information will also get replicated on those data nodes yeah exactly Okay, okay, and the OM will be having the file versus the uh, versus the block IDs. Yeah. Okay. So uh, that means we are keeping track of the block IDs at two level: one at the OM level, 
and another one at the um, data node level that this container versus this block ID. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And Ozone Manager, it doesn't have everything uh, in memory. Uh, it is stored in rocks DB. Okay. All right. So in one data node, how many container you can configure? And what is the ideal size? I think that can decide like how much metadata you can store in Ocean Manager. And in worst case scenario, if that is small, then it will be the similar issue what we see in HDFS. So uh, I, I don't uh, clearly get how we are comparing. So what I'm saying is that how from the data node and you're mm -hmm. saying that the container, how that say, relation is one to many in one data net, you can configure multiple container. Yeah, or one data one. node will have lots of containers. Yeah, so what I'm saying is that currently, for an example, you have said that container size should be 10 GB. What I'm saying is that if you make it like 1 GB, then it will also generate similar kind of meta info, which Ozone Manager has to store. Yeah, if you actually reduce the container size or if you reduce the container size to the block size that is there in uh, HDFS, you are basically generating the same amount of metadata inside SCM. The the yes. reason that we have increased the container size is to address the scalability issue. Okay. And if you reduce the container size to let's say 256 MB, you are basically storing only one block inside a container. Yeah, and that will same issue like... Yeah, uh, you, you are going back to the same problem now. Okay. On the sizing issue, the data node clusters I show would uh, be able to better answer on those parts, the dense data node size and all. Sure, sizing is a very deep topic, but um, sorry, I missed the overall question is in how deep we can go. Yeah, how many containers there can be on a data node. It depends on the disk that are there or the size of the data node. So the question was how many containers so can be stored on, on, on a single data node. Okay, so right now, we have actually pushed, or uh, you know, uh, ozone to about 600 TB per node. Right, that's the upper limit uh, right now. Right, that we are working on. We can can possibly go theoretically, it can go higher, um, but then you would have to the amount of RAM on the uh, you know, on the node and optimize it for whatever the workload is, whether it's a warehousing workload, a BI workload, all those considerations. But rule of thumb is we are sizing it around 400 TB to 450 TB per node in the field today. So if you want to get the rough idea on the number of containers, you can just uh, calculate 400 TB of size and each container is of 5 GB. And it also depends on, we do a lot of, uh, since we have this uh, rocks db in container we do a lot of uh, rocks db instance caching and all so it also depends on the ram that you have inside in the data node and increase the data node heap memory to speed up the process so sandeep has a question on where is the replica information stored so the replica information is uh, maintained in scm all the data nodes report uh, uh, or send container reports to SCM and SCM maintains the container ID to the list of replicas that are there. If any one of the replica goes down, uh, replica is unhealthy or if a data node goes down, those containers are marked as unreplicated and SCM takes action to re-replicate those containers. <laughs> Can RocksDB now that it's more than both yeah. So uh, RocksDB, the RocksDB has uh, this benchmarking they, where they said like uh, they uh, can support more than a billion keys in RocksDB. So if we are crossing that limit, uh, then we might have a RocksDB bottleneck. But with, um, since we are having an object store or flat key value store, 
we can easily shard the rocks db or have multiple rocks dbs in ozone manager and distribute the data across ozone manager that is one possible solution uh, when we run into issue where rocks db is bottleneck for us in scm i don't think we will run into rocks db uh, bottleneck because we are tracking containers not blocks so the metadata that scm manages will be far less when compared to the metadata that we have on ozone manager and in data node rocks db we will not run into issue because rocks dbs are for containers and containers will have limited number of blocks so the only place where we can run into rocks db uh, bottleneck issue is ozone manager where we can actually uh, implement something like having multiple rocks dbs and distributing the data across them does that answer your question subrat or we need more uh, yes uh, yes so what i was thinking is like this block is consisting of list of chunks right so uh, mm -hmm. so once we get the blocks so we need to get to the chunks and then from there with the reading will start right or writing yeah. uh, whatever so uh, so that will be part of the ozone manager and since you said like embedded db and whatever the uh, rocks db is there it is only one uh, like for instance right uh, for one uh, Ocean manager that will be only one rocks DB, so that's why I was thinking like uh, always it will be pointing to that DB. Although we have a replication uh, in the sense like we the other ocean manager is there. So okay, first of all, is it uh, like a active active HA or it is active standby? Like if uh, the when we active standby and uh, we use uh, rocks DB's block caching and all, so we we use a lot of caching in ozone manager to get the performance. And uh, the other thing is that we uh, recommend using SSDs for Ozone Manager and SCM to store RocksDB data. So if you are not using SSDs or NVMe, uh, your performance will be very bad. Okay, makes sense. Uh, so, so is there is any uh, like bin, meaning uh, while choosing RocksDB? Like whether we have done any kind of analysis, like why rocks db, why not others, uh, like radius and other things, like external um, key values, uh, MD so store is not been decided. If we go with some external uh, key value store, we we have to maintain that separately or ask the user to install or set it up separately, which will be an additional task. We want to simplify the design here. So you, if you compare mm -hmm. the uh, Oz Ozone Manager or SCM HA with uh, the name node HA, for name node HA, you need two name nodes, you need journal nodes, you need a zookeeper for uh, failover, and you need a failover controller to run on the name node. You have a lot of moving pieces to make uh, name node HA work. So we wanted to simplify that design, but if we are introducing an external DB, either be key value store or some other store. First of all, you, you will have a very big impact on the performance because you will making a network call to read the metadata, we, we, which is yeah. not good. Uh, other thing yeah. is that you, you have to install and maintain that separately. Yeah. yeah. Which sense. is also a ma maintenance for, for the user okay. or the administrator. Okay, but but the the uh, is it like the code has been uh, written such that like the user manager can have any um, uh, database or it is strictly uh, like uh, only rocks DB is supported currently? Like what I mean to say is like is it extendable to any other DB in future? Yeah, it is extendable. We have defined a clear interface uh, which uses this uh, storage layer or the DB uh, DB layer. So if you want to replace RocksDB, you just have to provide a different uh, implementation uh, for, for uh, the new storage that you want to introduce. You just have to uh, extend that interface and uh, implement those methods and plug in the DB. It is pluggable, but it is not uh, pluggable in a way where you just change a config and uh, put in the jars and uh, it will not work in that way. It requires some kind of uh, code change. But it is not tightly coupled. It is very loosely. Coupled. Got it. We Thank you. Initiated rocks DB and we just replaced it. Sorry, we used level DB and we just replaced it with rocks DB. So 
we we don't have tight coupling we have clear interface defined for that thank you thank you nandan so shrini if we take 16 mm small blocks can be part of file gym container p20 blocks look up be now done on data no yeah thanks shrini for making that statement So we have uh, all uh, that is there if, um, in the rocks DB as well, but uh, we don't use that because we use Rattis. Rattis has its own raft block which acts as a wall. So whatever transaction that we make by a Rattis that is recorded in the raft block. and then it is being applied or stored to the db so whenever there is a crash or something that happens on one of the ozone manager or scm and it is restarted ratis uh, will uh, reapply the raft log so we we uh, don't have to rely on the uh, rocks db wall we since we use ratis ratis guarantees us that all the transactions that are committed that is uh, available to us so any questions so far uh, on the things that we have discussed people on zoom intuition okay let's continue so uh, security in ozone uh, we i uh, used the same model that we had in hdfs uh, we used the kerberos for client security and uh, in ozone we uh, introduce something new uh, for the service interaction so let's say uh, ozone managers interacting with scm and data node is interacting with scm there we uh, didn't want to use kerberos always so we have introduced something uh, called uh, certificates uh, it is uh, same as uh, the certificates that we use in https and other things so we do certificate based authentication and we have uh, a certificate server that is uh, running inside scm which will issue certificates when whenever a new node registers itself we do the kerberos authentication uh, in the initial phase and we issue certificates and after that whenever there is a communication within services inside ozone they do certificate based authentication and uh, all the clients that connect to ozone when once security is enabled they do kerberos based authentication and for uh, block read and write uh, we do uh, block token support so a ozone manager will issue tokens and uh, the client has to uh, take the token to the data node and data node will validate that token and then uh, you can able you will be able to read and write the data for s3 we have support to generate s3 secrets we have command to generate s3 secrets using which you can generate the secrets and use the same secrets to uh, access ozone so uh, and apart from uh, authentication uh, uh, we we also have encryption uh, data at rest encryption and uh, wired encryption we you just have to uh, enable them uh, by config changes once you enable them you, you you will have wired encryption enabled and for data at rest encryption you need to have a uh, key management uh, server installed and uh, you have to create an encryption zone and you have to set the bucket uh, you have to set it at bucket level by creating the bucket after that whatever data that you write into that bucket will be encrypted on this so we uh, primarily focused on ease of use for uh, ozone so, uh, so uh, you 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 have you don't have to uh, fine tune uh, the heap uh, because we don't we do partial uh, name space caching and we don't have everything in memory so heap is not overloaded we haven't we have simplified the ha model as we talk uh we discussed before we don't have uh, zkfc process zookeeper or journal nodes we just use uh, three um uh, 
master services for HA model. And we have this recon server where you can monitor the system. And all is the clients uh, get most of the configuration from OEM server itself. So even fine tuning the clients would be uh, very, very easy. Uh, before getting into features and uh, demo, uh, she will cover a bit on uh, how Ozone is being used uh, and uh, what is to be expected of Ozone. Yeah, over to you, Shri. Sure, would you like me to... Uh... Yeah, yeah, I uh, stop sharing. You can stop sharing or I change the presentation. Yeah, you always fine. Okay, you want me to share my screen? I'm going to share this. Yeah, so I go straight to the top here. Um, hopefully, people can uh, see my screen. Yes, no, I get a thumbs up or something. You can't see my screen. Okay, perfect. Okay, yeah, so. What I'd like to do is, uh, first of all, uh, my name is Jim Munti. I'm a product manager for uh, Ozone. And um, I'd like to walk you through a few key things that came up um, from a what we have learned using Ozone, for, uh, you know, uh, what we've done or learned by running HDFS for 10 years. So to begin with, um, the open source users and contributors are the heart of the system, right? So most of the folks who are on this call who are contributors, thank you very much. And these are currently the big users of uh, Ozone as of today. I'll let the links uh, you know, take you to details as you might need it. Okay. So today, when I talk to customers, typically when they're running large scale analytics over object stores, uh, you know, the data flow looks like this, right? For each large data set, list all the files, like 100,000 files, read large chunks of data, GB at a time, and so on, right? So the key assumptions for all of this seems to be atomicity, consistency, and durability for every one of these use cases. All big data projects, Spark, Kai, Trino, and Pala, take anyone, and vendors like um, AWS, uh, Cloudera, ourselves, uh, Azure, HD, Site Databricks, everybody uses the Hadoop compatible file system to access these objects in right? HCFS. Now, when they are running these large um, analytics, what did we learn right? over the last 10 years or so with the HDFS? We've learned that um, the SDA connector has been developed uh, with investments from folks like Hortonworks, uh, Western Digital, Netflix, and so on. Azure Connector went through its iterations to support ABFS, ADLS, and now uh, Gen 2, ADLS Gen 2, right? And the Azure Storage team maintains that along with Cloudera. The GCS Connector is supported by the GCP team also in cooperation with Cloudera. So this is something that's pretty universally acknowledged and supported by all the big, both hyperscalers uh, and large corporations. So object stores uh, like S3 can suffer tremendous penalties due to the protocol or the operating environment, this, uh, access patterns, uh, correctness story, uh, and metadata operations. Right? So all of these seem to uh, create all kinds of bottlenecks and unexpected things that you need usually an expert to queue. What we those on, right? We, given that atomic operations for directories in the pod, efficient metadata listings at scale, strong read up write consistency for all operations, massive throughput through the use of binary protocols. It has, Ozone has demonstrated that it is at performance parity with HDFS for petabyte scale with data workloads. No one else comes close, no other uh, system. So this is something that is proven with data, and it is the way forward for HDFS in general. This is the next step. The way I look at it is the next evolution of HDFS will be also. So that said, I just wanted to quickly uh, recap on several things that uh, Nanda, Nanda has already touched upon. You know, security, encryption, snapshots, application. These are all enterprise class data management features that we. Uh, support. We can go into great detail on each of those, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to uh, summarize like this. And from an operations perspective, uh, we have full support for lifecycle management, 
including updates with parcels, which actually allows minimally disruptive um, uh, upgrades, um, tenant management, uh, including you know uh, Ranger AC and integration, um, health services like Recon, and finally uh, storage balancer or just storage utilization and erasure query. Again, each of these topics can take uh, a whole two hours to talk about. So I'll just leave it at that high level. And I will leave you with this one thought. If you said, okay, what's the difference between HDFS and Ozone? From a density perspective, Ozone can go to thousands of nodes at 600 TB per node. 600 TB is what we have actually demonstrated. 400, 450 is what we are actually uh, recommending our customers to use today. I think SyncSign is entirely doable in production within the next you know, few quarters. HDFS stops out at 100 TB per node. Scalability, 10 billion objects. We have actually shown this, uh, I think, to one of our large enterprise customers already. We simulated this and showed this. Uh, HDFS, of course, is uh, 400 million objects. Recovery-wise, Ozone is very fast. Um, and HDFS is size-dependent. By availability, we can have a full active access system um, and protocol support, which is what Nanda has been talking about earlier. Uh, we are full S3 API compatible. Right? This is the you know, two-minute elevator pitch uh, for why anybody needs to go to Ozone. Right? How am I doing on time, Nanda? Because can I can continue. Uh, we have time. Another two minutes? Yeah, yeah. Okay. You Let me walk through some of this. I have six key use cases that I think about when I talk to my customers. Right? One <laughs> is the old SDA API support which you talked about. And the key business benefits are you basically write, you develop in one spot and you can run your application anywhere. Right? That's the anything developed on-prem runs in the cloud. So it's a single application platform for AI, ML, GPU workloads. Uh, and of course, I'm not going to list out all the operational benefits, but it's just a lot easier with a single pane of glass with, with Ozone. The second, um, so this slide again talks, it's just a different way of looking at the multiple protocol support. It's a little easier to see uh, how we support OFS, HDFS, and ST, um, and, uh, you know, containerization access and everything. So with a second use case that I think about is consolidating small tenants. People have lots of clusters and a lot of individual tenants, which leads to management complexity, uh, especially on prem with older CDP and CDH, HTTP clusters. So these can then be separated, is consolidated into one large cluster, an ozone cluster, dense cluster, so that way your footprint is reduced and you replace all the external object stores uh, with a single storage system. You can scale up to, like I said, 10 billion objects. Okay. Now, use case three is splitting up compute and storage. This is especially useful when you have things like noisy neighbors and tenants that require a lot of more handholding than others. So once you've got it in this format, um, you can upgrade and manage storage and um, compute separately. And the whole point about separating compute experience, so that way you can eliminate that noisy neighbor problem. And um, also the SDX layer, in our case, that's the um, access policies, lineage, and security layer. That's the SDX layer into a single data layer. The third use case, uh, sorry, the fourth use case uh, in this case is modern architecture standards. This is the one who, you know, customers want to adopt S3 as the standard, um, easy integration with various workloads, and a single storage inter interface for all their applications. So you basically run it on-prem in the cloud and develop one set of um, apps. Um, it's, and of course, there are customers today who come to us and said, we have all these scale limits. And as you have seen so far, we can easily go past those scale limits. Like there's clear benefits uh, you know, where you don't have to have new application chains or any of the porting that is needed. So that's the, the high level take on that. And the last use case is near node management. So I've had customers on HDFS having all kinds of issues because of near node pressure. And given the architecture of Ozone, that problem is solved. So it scales linearly and your recovery times are much, much faster. And on the detail that Nanda just went to, into on ProxDB about performance 
uh, and availability, right? So with, with that, I, I, I think I've uh, covered all the main use cases that I'm thinking about. I'd love to hear about any other use cases or special problems that you're seeing in the community that way we can find ways to address them. So you can always reach out to me or Nanda and let us know. Okay, that's, I'll stop there. Any questions? Yeah. yeah. People on call, you uh, guys want, if you have a different use case that you want to discuss or bring up, uh, you can just uh, unmute and just let us know. We can have a small discussion around it and we can see how Ozone solves the problems. Yes. Yeah, the, one of the use cases, could it be the archival use case as well? Like where we have got the uh, data, a lot of data is being created at the customer side and we want to store the data into the uh, archival. So can we propose uh, Ozone for that kind of uh, use cases? Yes, you can. Actually, it works very well for archival use cases. And um, you can certainly propose that. And we can even sit behind other people's primary storage, right? Which is, uh, for example, if they have teradata and then you want to go behind it, you can still do that. Uh, you can because we talk S3, we are happy to use that. So, sure, I can answer. I mean, right now we even seven one seven SP one, right? We are still proposing it to be used as archival. I mean, we have deployed a few customers where the storage is just archival, and the okay. challenge. That is, uh, you are co-locating your masters, so your ozone manager and your name node both sits on the same node as per our initial design. But moving ahead, I think that would be a challenge where we are actually recommending some uh, different aspects. So please keep a watch on the sizing and uh, best practices uh, if you are using HDFS and ozone together, right? So. Understand. Okay. Point taken. Sorry. Yep. Yeah. Okay, did you hear that? He was suggesting co-locating. Uh, yeah, we can actually co-locate OM and SCM, but uh, if you are co-locating Ozone Manager and Name Node, there will be a resource crunch on or we will run into a lot of uh, performance issues because Name Node requires a lot of RAM. Uh, it's 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 not Nanda. It's not about RAM. Uh, I think uh, we had this discussion earlier, but uh, so now the moving ahead. I think uh, we are recommending that uh, Ozone Manager should have a dedicated master node. If you are using AFS and Ozone together, so okay. yeah, for the best performance because the network that throughput that goes on name node as well as on your uh, SCMs, right? So mm -hmm. both are very heavy, and if both runs on the same node, you will have some network bottlenecks. That's the on-ground challenges that we face right now. So yeah, we can definitely discuss this uh, offline and you know come up with the best practices or a runbook or how to use Ozone and Archive. In case. Yeah, and as far as uh, non-archival cases are concerned, so uh, can we claim that it is as good as, you know, uh, working with HDFS and working on the hot data where the ozone is also equivalently, you know, good on the performance, on the analysis and the queries that we run? Yes. So the short answer is yes, which is, is ozone on parity with HDFS, right? And that was the summary question. Correct. And the short answer is yes. And we are continuously working to make uh, product improvements that actually improve performance for various use cases. Okay, in that case, it won't only be uh, limited to the uh, archival use cases, rather uh, put their active workloads onto the ozone. That's what we are. Yes, yes. archival is one use case, correct, of many. Okay, okay. Okay. There is a question on uh, chat. Okay. Okay. This is from Mandel. Okay. Um, so the question is how would Ozone support multi cloud consistent storage? Right. Many IO claims they deploy in different clouds and they can provide consistent storage across multi hybrid cloud between clouds. So today, 
we can replicate one ozone cluster on-prem to on-prem, right? And when they are saying that they want to deploy it in the cloud, so I'm trying to clarify the question here. So is this an entirely cloud-based workload? Wendell, or um, if it is, then ozone in the cloud, I'd like to understand the economics that there people people are talking about. Because why would you run ozone in the cloud when they have other kinds of office space? So the scenario is um, how we have a consistent storage across cloud. So for example, as you mentioned, we simplify the customer application across different environments um, in hybrid cloud or multi-cloud, then they can run same application against S3 API, but in Azure, I don't think you can use this in Azure uh, storage, uh, ADFS. So the uh, mini IO and their solution is actually fully based in Kubernetes. Okay. Uh, they say uh, it's fully consistent across different cloud and also hybrid. Right. I, I, I have seen that claim, but I'm not quite sure it's, uh, it's verifiable at this point. But, but definitely happy to take this as a you know, competitive intelligence point, and we can work this offline. Given the content that Nanda wants to finish today, but yes, your point is taken. Uh, we will address that Minayo, uh, shall we say, use case, where they're saying they're consistent. So I'll take this as one of my to do why not? Okay. So guys, any more questions or we can continue with the demo. I had a couple of slides on uh, the features that are there in Ozone, but I don't think we can cover it today. We can, uh, I'll see if we can have a follow-up meetup so that we can get uh, into the internals of Ozone. Yeah. We'll, we'll try to schedule follow-up meetups at them, li like this to get to know more about Ozone or how to contribute and even code walk to for people who are interested in contributing to Ozone. So are there any topics you would like to hear, uh, you know, discuss in the next meetup? Please let us know. Then, you know, we're happy to discuss that as well. Yep, we, we can actually uh, get list of topics and then schedule follow-up meetups. And that you intend to cover the for stories that you string the legacy uh, Tools, any strategies Currently, for migration, we uh, only have uh, this CP to do the data migration. The application migration, you don't have to change anything. You can just point it to Ozone and things would work fine. But uh, for data migration, we just have uh, this CP. For data handling? Yeah, you can just do uh, this CP of the files and create the tables here. Yeah. I or H basic of H frames. Yeah. And uh Shiv, there is a migration tool for H base as well, right? Yes. You can use that migration tool to migrate the data. We, we have the same HDFS compatibility, so it is seem like migrating from one HDFS cluster to another cluster. For DR, you have to do the replication and swap the HBS, so then you can follow the same steps here to do it. <laughs> So for all the migration cases, we can assume that uh, Ozone is another HDFS compatible cluster or HDFS cluster. You can do the migration and then start your service on the Ozone cluster. So any more questions, guys? Yeah. Should probably work with it. We should run the demo of this. Yeah, this is the good part. So we'll see how uh, ozone is being used with hype. <laughs> so this is a, a secure cluster. So we have to do and clean it before uh, creating or accessing ozone. So we will do uh, the key in it to get the 
tickets and then we would start uh, create um, start with creating the volumes and markets and then uh, run hive query in queue to create the table and write data to it yeah here we are using uh, o3 uh, interface which is an object store interface to create the volume you can use a uh, uh, file system interface as well. Uh, and also you can use S3 interface as well. It, ha it has uh, different syntax, but you would, at the end, you would uh, achieve the same thing like creating volume or creating bucket or creating keys. So now we have created the, uh, the volume and bucket. We will be giving uh, permissions uh, we have uh, enabled Ranger for Ozone now, so all the uh, security part and all the Ranger principle has to be added so that uh, the user has access to the volume and bucket. Mm -hmm. So we'll be adding the Ranger policies for the Hive user. will be using you to uh, run the queries. So if you see here in the query, uh, you would be able to see that the location uh, has O3 FS as the scheme, which uh, is the o Ozone file system uh, location. So the files that are created will uh, land in Ozone. Yeah. So where are the files created? So these files uh, will be created inside Ozone. Okay. The mm -hmm. volume and the bucket that we have created and the location that we have pointed in the create query. So that is the location where the, uh, these files or the data will be written. Okay. Uh, so we are actually reading from Ozone here to uh, list the table content. Understand. Okay. <laughs> Each separate insert will create a separate object. The, those logins are handled by Hive. So Hive, uh, they will run uh, the file moving or if it's a managed table, they will do all these things. So this, for coming there. This is not related to So Hive uses Ozone as a storage the same way it uses HDFS. Mm -hmm. Instead of pointing to HDFS, Hive is being pointed to Ozone now. So whenever we do any operation on Hive, it is actually accessing Ozone instead of HDFS. But there is no code change or nothing done in Hive to do that.
Yeah, that's neat. This is showing lineage, like where it came from. Yeah, what's happening? So here we are listing the files that are created previously using height. So we have pointed this uh, volume wall one. one and bucket one to create the files. So these are all the keys that are created by height files or the files that are written by height. Mm -hmm. okay. And if you guys want to try out Ozone, we have uh, Ozone Docker containers as well. So you, you can just let me quickly open. So if you go to the Ozone uh, website uh, and uh, to the documentation page, you will have different options to uh, try out Ozone. And uh, one of the easier way to do is to run Ozone in Docker to get a feel of uh, how you can interact with Ozone or play around with Ozone. You can just uh, do a Docker run of this. So this image will be fetched from Docker Hub. And if you have your Docker uh, installed on your laptop, you can just run Ozone inside Docker. Just by running the single command, you will get uh, access to Ozone to play around with it. Yeah, these are all uh, APIs using which you can uh, play around with Ozone to see uh, how data is being written or uh, writing data through one API, and you can try to read it via a different API to see how they are interoperable. <laughs> Any, any questions? Um, we are almost the end. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question. So, uh, when we are saying that all the file system is compatible with uh, uh, Hadoop file system, and we can use the uh, Hive and Spark as it is, uh, so does it mean that uh, Ozone allows? file appending after closing the first write stream? So we uh, don't support, uh, uh, if I understand correctly, you are asking if we have append support yeah. after closing the file, right? So yes. currently we don't have append support implemented in Ozone yet, but we have it in the roadmap. So once a key or a file is closed, uh, it is uh, immutable. You can just delete it or overwrite it. There, there is no append operation right now. Yeah, thanks for answering. And uh, I have one more question. So yeah. in S3, uh, the file um, move is actually uh, rewriting uh, with deletion. Uh, okay. Is it same in Ojon or uh, is it just uh, like file pointer uh, rewriting? We, uh, in the initial phase, we had this problem. So now we have optimized it. So your file move is not same as uh, the S3 copy operation right now. It is a metadata operation. So That's we have right. optimized all those things. So if you do an uh, file move, it is just a metadata, not file copy and delete. That's great. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. And for, for the file system API, we even optimize the move operation for directories. So even if you move a directory, it is just an uh, O of one operation. You just uh, change uh, the parent directory name. Uh, like it sounds like more advanced object storage than uh, other cloud ones. Yeah. Does it still work across volumes? Not across volumes. There is the same one. Yeah. Rename is not supported across all yeah. Not even across buckets. It is within the buckets. Yeah, we are open for questions. <laughs> Still have seven more minutes. Bang. So for, uh, say I have uh, 
real time uh, application that I asked about the And uh, so today, what we do is we run Spark, we write application, we receive the uh, ID sign, we use Spark externally uh, for storing the uh, post cost of uh, data. And from there, we do the uh, analysis and whatnot. Uh, so if you have to replace that uh, Spark experiment PD, you directly uh, with the tools for storage. Uh, would it, you would still get the same performance from I mean, as using as an external from Spark or how do you Performance is being uh, almost match HDFS performance. So instead of uh, providing your scheme as HDFS, you can replace it with O3FS or OFS. You you will write in those. You don't have to do any changes to your application or anything, and you will get the same performance. Okay. We have optimized a lot for uh, the file system operations to make sure that Spark, Hive, and other big data applications work and uh, give the same token. The, the problem we are facing is like, uh, say we have a thirty second micro batches, mm -hmm. so for a day to create many people's right? Yeah, if you yeah, you don't have small Yeah. So you, you can actually replace it with ozone. You will get performance and you don't have to worry about uh, the small file if you are uh, having load on the leading node. Uh, can I have one more question? Yeah. Yeah. So I like. For Amazon S3 or other object storages, uh, this CP uses multi-part of node instead of multiple blocks. So it allows only like four or eight concurrent uh, uh, connections. And that's one of the main reasons why it's very slow. While mm -hmm. this CP with HDFS allows like blocks uh, with 100 megabytes. Um, but, uh, is it same? Like, what does Ozone work like? Um, is it same with HDFS or is it similar with S3? Like, is it? Uh, okay. In implementation wise, it is similar to HDFS. You have uh, the same concept of blocks, and uh, if you run this CP, you, you will have a uh, different uh, separate uh, no tasks running which will copy the files or copy the blocks directly. So it will give same performance as HDFS. But if you have application which is written for S3 and you are using multi-part upload and other things, we also have multi-part upload support. You have to go through S3, Ozone S3 gateway. So we have all those APIs, but internally the implementation of this CP or data copy is similar to what is there in GDFS. Okay, sounds really good. <laughs> Thank you. He actually took all the uh, good things that are there in HDFS and addressed the scalability issues and other issues that we feel uh, were present in HDFS. Hi, right, teacher. Great children. <laughs> sure. But similar to Hive, R, and their other big data tools, the Ozone is already integrated. Yeah, so Brett, uh, Ozone uh, work, can work with Spark, Hive. Uh, we were working on uh, getting integrated it uh, with uh, Impala. Ozone works with Impala as well now. So you can pretty much use all the big data applications which uh, can run on HDFS. Uh, you can just run it on Ozone. Hello. Yeah. Uh, this is Kairul Hassan. Uh, I want, uh, we are using CDP uh, 717 SP1. Mm -hmm. So if I want to use the Ozone in our cluster, so how can we do this? 717 comes with, uh, we have Ozone in 717. So you can install Ozone in 717. Okay. 
So you, uh, you can install and start uh, playing around with Ozone to see how your application works on top of it. Okay. So about uh, this is uh, about uh, uh, add Ozone service into a current uh, CDP cluster. I think there are two ways. One way is add new nodes and install Ozone in new nodes. One, another way is uh, add Ozone service in current uh, HDFS uh, nodes. Which which one is better? Which one do you uh, recommend? Okay, so we recommend uh, having new nodes or separate node for master service and uh, which has SSDs. You can actually co-locate the data node service with the uh, HDFS data node as well. So that you don't have to get, uh, let's say you have 50 data nodes running, you don't have to go and get another 20 data nodes for Ozone. You can just co-locate, add additional disks so to the Benda, existing data Benda. nodes and co-locate the data node services. Then the question is whether to add it as a service or uh, as a separate pass. So. So you you can add it as a service, I guess. In CM, if you are seven one seven, you should be uh, you will be having option to uh, add ozone as service. But if you uh, if your question is like while adding it as a service, should I uh, can I use the existing nodes that is being used by HDFS? Yeah, you can use it. We recommend using a separate node for master service. In other words, you can um, share the storage, right? Yeah. But make sure that the master node has enough compute resources by yeah. itself. Did, did that answer the question? Um, so you answered about the master services. So I, I understand now about okay. the data nodes. Do you have any recommendations? So I think either works. So the customer might ask uh, which one is better. It depends on the workload, right? Uh, okay. uh, but but really, you know, having separate data nodes means you're keeping you have to point all the ozone storage to that those data nodes only. So yeah, so uh, you can share the data node with HDFS data node, but you have to make sure that you are configuring separate disks for ozone. So one of the problem that you can run into uh, by sharing the data node service is that, or we have seen these problems, like if you are sharing the same disk with uh, Ozone and HDFS data node, then you might end, HDFS might end up utilizing the disk uh, and uh, Ozone will not have enough space or you will get into uh, disk IO bottlenecks. So you, you can share the uh, nodes, but uh, configure separate disks for Ozone data node process and separate disk for HDFS data node process. And uh, if you have SSDs, it is better or uh, recommended to configure uh, the RAF meta location on SSD disk, which will improve the performance. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Shubhrit's second question is, what are the disadvantages of Ozone so far? So I wouldn't say disadvantage. One additional thing you need for Ozone is that uh, you need SSDs. For HDFS, since everything is in memory, you need more RAM. But uh, there, uh, HDFS doesn't recommend you to have SSDs on new mode. But here, you need to have SSDs on the master nodes if you need performance. Other than that, uh, we don't see any disadvantages of Ozone so far. Yeah, may you see any particular use cases that are not suitable for Ozone, like lots of small files, frequent access, any of those kinds of issues where HDFS may actually may be a good thing? Right? Because today we have HDFS and Ozone coexisting in the same cluster. In fact, it's required for the most part. So, um, if we decide we want to have some workloads on HDFS and some on Ozone, which do you think you should have on HDFS versus Ozone? So, initially, uh, when we were catching up with the performance of HDFS, we uh, used to recommend having our table use case for Ozone. Okay. 
but we made lot of performance improvements in ozone uh, in recent months or recent years so we have uh, we are almost at par with the hdfs on performance other than the performance issue because of the disk io involved in metadata access there is nothing that is not there in ozone which is there in hdfs perfect okay awesome And we are also working on the feature sets that are there in HDFS to have the same set of feature set in Ozone. So snapshot work is currently going on. We have erasure coding and um, we already have security. We have uh, HA support for master nodes. We are working on decommissioning uh, support as well for master nodes. We have decommissioning support for data nodes, but the SCM decommissioning uh, feature is currently being developed. Yeah, we we have to pass time. So, any more questions? Just one. I have another question. Um, so, we we need to upload data from Tira Data uh, using is uh, scoop. So, we are right now we are using it in uh, HDFS in Hive Table. Eh? So, mm -hmm. if we use Ozone, so is there any performance improvement or any performance impact? There should not be any performance impact. Uh, it should be same. You, you are using Scoop and Hive to uh, write the data, right? So yes, we yes. can uh, Hive uh, works very well with Ozone. So you can just point to Ozone and uh, start your workload. Data should get into Ozone. Okay, we need to test it then. And there was a uh, question about GeoRed. So you, uh, we, you can use the same concept uh, that is there or same uh, logic mm. that is there for HDFS. For GeoRed, you have to do the data copy or data sync, uh, which uh, in Cloudra we have media job and other things. So currently, uh, before maybe a couple of months back, we didn't have snapshot support. So every time uh, the whole file will be copied. Since we don't have the uh, logic to identify the delta that is there between the last sync and the current sync. Now, snapshot support is there and snapdish support is there. So if you want to have GeoRed, just uh, have create snapshot, copy the data. And next time, if you want to sync, create another snapshot, get the snap diff. It will give us the delta. You can copy the delta files. So it is same as what we have in VPFS. Interesting, you don't have to snap diff, right? And every time you copy a snapshot, it just copies into Yeah, you, you can actually it. use uh, HDFS or Ozone Snap Diff. So it will give you just okay. the delta files. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. Can I replace the uh, HDFS with Ozone? Yeah, you should be able to uh, run all your applications or use case that you're currently running on HDFS directly on Ozone. There is nothing that is blocking uh, you to run your application on Ozone. Okay. Let's say that, okay, I have an HDFS service running on my cluster. Mm -hmm. And I have a Ozone, Ozone uh, implementation also there. Mm -hmm. Can I turn off the HDFS service since I have Ozone in place? No. Uh, currently with uh, CDP, uh, we have a dependency for deploying or distributing the fine configurations. So there is a dependency uh, for Ozone to have HDFS. So you need uh, HDFS running for a CDP cluster. But if you are uh, using open source Ozone, you don't need that uh, dependency or you can just run Ozone without HDFS. But there, if you are running open source, then you have to manage your cluster. You don't get Cloudra Manager or all the orchestration that comes with CDP. So ideally, uh, you can run Ozone without HDFS, but for um, in CDP cluster, we have a dependency for now. Maybe in future releases, we will uh, remove that dependency where you can just uh, turn off HDFS and just run Ozone. That That is there in the roadmap. Uh, since you said that uh, in CDP, Ozone has a dependency with HDFS service, 
Can I use the same same data notes for my watch on? Yeah, you can use the same notes. You have to start the ozone data node process separately. So your HDFS data nodes the process will be running. You can use the same machine to configure ozone data nodes. But just make sure that you are uh, adding new disks or configuring separate disks for ozone and separate disks for HDFS so that you don't get into uh, I.O. or disk bottleneck or disk performance issues. So you don't have to add additional nodes for data, ozone data nodes. You can reuse the same set of nodes that are there. Okay. Does that mean that ozone requests a data node service like the HDFS survey? Yeah. Role, role, okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone.